Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, Stephen, if you want to, you can, you're, you, the rest of your family's are over here. You can sit over here if you want. You're good? You're good there? Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So, Rachel, I'm glad you're here. Ashish, Anjale, thank you for being here. So, yeah, you guys, would you guys stand up? So, this is Rachel and Ashish, their son, and Anjale. <laughs> so, and Rachel was in the video. Yeah, so she, she works in the autism ministry. Is that right? Primarily there, maybe a hundred other things as well. But and we've got a group of us with the privilege of heading over uh, later this year, which we're excited about, Lord, Lord, uh, Lord willing and enabling us. And, and I do want to extend the invitation, as Dr. George has, to join them and hear more right after, even if you weren't planning on it. We've gotten better over the years at Mars Hill of signing up for stuff ahead, you know, which kind of helps the planning process. But intentionally, around this lunch, we left a bunch of spots open. So even if you have not registered your, your place ahead for the lunch, it's in the basement. So down that door, uh, through that door and down the stairs right beneath us is where, is where that lunch will happen. would love to have you join in and be a part of that, okay? And if you'd like to text in uh, questions today, there's the phone number to do so. We had about nine or ten really good questions in the first service, uh, of which I answered zero during the service. <clears throat> so, um, but what we've started, we've done two weeks now on posting a podcast episode late in the week with, with the questions that are asked, so they won't go unanswered. I'm sure we won't have time to get to any live today, um, so look for those later in the week, but do send them in. I think that helps our, enhances our time of learning, uh, and, and so I encourage you to do that. So we're in Mark 13. If you've got it there, grab it great. And I want to ask you to consider, too, we're going to look at two other places as well. If you want to go ahead and prepare yourself, at least mentally prepare, like, hey, we're going to do this. We can do this. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to be in Matthew chapter 13 later as well, that I'm going to ask, where I'm going to ask you to turn. <clears throat> So we can do this and um, get a lot out of it. So what we've done is we've been studying the Gospel of Mark as we've separated chapter 13 into a little three-part mini-series within the series because it's all about the end times. And so today's the third of the three parts on that. Um, and we're going to read verses 24 through 37, uh, but we'll be all over Mark 13 in the process. And did you guys know that next week is Mother's Day? Yeah, there's a bunch of you who that was the first blip on your radar. They're like, oh, all right, you're welcome. All right, so let's not miss that. And, and so next week, check this out, a little preview. I'd love to have you bring mom to church. Come look down in chapter 14, verse 6. There's a phrase there at the beginning of verse 6. It says, leave her alone. That's going to be like our whole theme next week. So <laughs> just a little preview. Okay. But here we go. Let me read from verse 24 through 37. This is where I believe in chapter 13, the primary emphasis of time frame shifts from uh, primarily the application of what Jesus says before this, even though there's application always to all generations, right? The, the primary application as far as upcoming events that Jesus is preparing them for is going to be on the first century followers of Christ, those right there with Him, Peter, James, John, and Andrew that are having this conversation with Him that that then Mark records for us later. And in verse 24 is where I think it shifts to primarily the, the group of people who will be alive in and around the events leading up to and culminating with Jesus' second coming, even though, again, there's a great application for, for people of all times embedded in it. All right, so here we go. I'll read from the New American Standard. Just follow in whatever translation you've got there. It says, But in those days, verse 24, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then He will send forth the angels and will gather together His elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest, farthest end of heaven. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that He is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed, keep on the alert, 
for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his servants in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. And so let's just dive right in here, everybody. <laughs> and, and remember, uh, the question that begins all of chapter 13 is the guys ask him, when will these things be? When will these things happen? And verse 23 has been kind of our theme to, around our title of this little mini-series where Jesus says, look, I've told you everything ahead of time. He's told us everything we need to know on a need-to-know basis. He's told us what we need to know, and I'm thankful He hasn't told us more, even though our curiosity has uh, a desire for so much more. He's told us what's helpful. And remember, as we go through this, the three audiences that He's addressing. He's addressing His immediate followers, first century believers. He's addressing those who will be alive at the end. I think that's what He means by this generation, quote-unquote, in verse 30, the generation in and around the second coming. And then He's addressing really every, every believer in between. From the time he said it till, till he comes back, it has application for us. And there's three main uh, things, there's three main points, there's three uh, s- content issues or, or subjects that he is giving us in this chapter. The first is things to do, which we focused on two weeks ago. The second is things to know. And remember, this is always embedded, even in those parts of the Bible that, that have some confusing, uh, have, have a confusing nature to it. There's so much that's so clear that we can hang our hats on and build our lives on. So this, we, we've looked at those things. And then there's things that we can't know for sure. It's hard to put a concrete and clear um, you know, statement around what exactly he's talking about. How is it exactly going to play out? What does it mean by this? How long is that time word, you know, frame of reference referring to in, in our way of calculating time? You know, the things we don't know for sure, but they're still given for a reason, right? And that's where our focus is going to be today. Some of these things that a little bit confusing, but still important. And let's be clear on that. As we approach the Bible, as you start maybe, get into studying the Bible for your own growth and development, remember that, right? These things that we call, they they come under the heading of eschatology, which means the study of end times, you know, prophetic stuff, stuff that's still not happened yet. God's, there's lots of places in the Bible that kind of tell us about that. It's real easy, if we're not careful, to, to succumb to how difficult it is to interpret a lot of it, to succumb to that uh, temptation to say, well, since it's so difficult and, hey, it's kind of in mysterious, symbolic language, then just forget about it. I'm going to kind of ignore those parts of the Bible, ignore those passages, and just focus on the other stuff. That's tempting, maybe. And I know people have kind of taken that approach. But don't let, I'm encouraging you not to take that approach. Because if it's in the book, it's in the book for, for good reasons. So even though I, I, on one hand, I think the balance is we don't want to get caught up in, and there's people who follow into this temptation too. They're like, uh, you know, that, that, that old movie, uh, you know, American Treasure, looking for, looking for all the, the, the secret codes embedded, you know, and how do you lay out a, a, a map and find where X marks the spot and answer all the puzzle pieces as it appears to be presented. People get caught up in that, distracted that way. But there's people that run the other way, the other end of the extreme, like we'll just ignore it altogether. No. It's in here for a reason. So I think this third purpose we need to remember, you know, we can't know it for sure, a lot of it, un- until I think it happens. We'll know when we know. It'll become evident. But we are supposed to learn it. We are supposed to pay attention to it, and we, we kind of log it away in the back of our minds. We're aware of what the Bible says because it is important. It is relevant. And so that as we are called to do what we've focused on, stay focused on doing what He's given us to do. Stay focused on building our lives on what is clear and easy to say, that it's concrete and and knowable. But we do so in light of what we've also seen, that that, that the main action item is, you know, be on the alert, keep your eye open, be watching, right? So we log these things away in the back of our mind. They're things we can expect, and we don't just ignore them. We don't play dumb. We don't stick our head in the sand. We just, okay, I know that's there, so I've got an eye on the sky. I've got an eye on the things as they might unfold, even perhaps 
in my lifetime. Okay, so that's where we're going to focus today. Things we don't know for sure, but we can certainly expect. And I want to point out just a couple of them and then, and then move on to the two that I really want to focus on. In verse 8, I think we can, we can expect an increase in the intensity of events leading up to Jesus' coming. Notice at the end of verse 8, that's what he says. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Isn't that interesting? So he's describing some of these events that he talks about, like earthquakes, famines, and you know, we're going to get into the 20, verses 24 and 25, talking about signs in the heavens even, this kind of shaking of the natural world, some of those kinds of signs. We can expect them to increase in intensity and uh, in proximity to each other in time-wise. I, mean, I think that's just the super simple application of, of the analogy he's drawing. They're like birth pangs. They're going to get closer together. They're going to get more intense, all these events and signs. Okay, but still, can you see how that's still in the category of what does that mean concretely, right? And I know Christians, we do this here in the United States, like if it was a particularly busy hurricane season, all of a sudden we're like, oh, that was more hurricanes than ever before. And Okay, I don't know. Again, this is still in the realm of how do you exactly understand and interpret how it's going to play out. But let's log that away. We, we, can, we can be looking for that. An increase in intensity uh, and in, in proximity to each other time-wise. The second thing, he says, that these signs, there'll be this great shaking. And it's, a little, it's very mysterious and very scary, isn't it? Verse 24 and 25, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven. How extensively, how will we know when, when this is being fulfilled as he intends it, as he means it, as he says it? Let me just, I'm going to read this. You don't have to turn to this one, but in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 21, listen to how say, the parallel passage, listen to what Luke adds into this teaching of Jesus that's, that's relevant for us. To put it in pers- even a greater clarity here. He says, there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars. That's the way Luke records it. And on the earth, dismay among the nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. Men will be fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Okay. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. So, exact same context, exact same story. Luke just gives us these added pieces that Jesus said that Mark has summarized a little more concisely. People are going to, we can expect, again, log this away. All right, it's not going to freak us out when it happens. He's given us what we need to know. We'll know when we know. We can expect the cosmic order to be greatly unsettled. Again, can't know specifically. What does that mean exactly? All right, but we kind of know. And we're not freaked out. You know what's amazing about following God, and I encourage you to follow God, with all your heart, with your primary energy and focus of your life. What's amazing about following God is the followers of God, as we get into knowing and learning Him and learning His ways and see, understanding more clearly what He's revealed to us in His Word is, you know, we kind of know this already. We, We kind of have this expected. You go back to the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, Psalm 46. It says that even if the mountains crumble and, and fall into the heart of the sea and the, and the sea rages and roars and foams with its surging, he says, yet I will not fear. And he goes on to say, because in essence, I know who's in control of this. I know who ultimately has the final say, and I know who's calling the shots, and I know whose agenda is unfolding here ultimately, and I am safe in his hands. So Jesus is, with a little more specificity, uh, giving us the reality that this indeed is going to happen. We can expect this, and the world is going to be freaking out at some point, right? But not those who know what He's given us to know ahead of time, okay? This is a big deal. So now let's get to to the last two I want to focus on, these two events that Jesus mentions. The first is in verse 14. So if you've got that, look at that. We've mentioned it a couple times, but we haven't focused on it yet. He, Jesus says, when you see this thing, he calls it the abomination of desolation. And if you go, I believe, into the Matthew rendering of this, the, the parallel passage in Matthew, Jesus refers specifically to this abomination of desolation as referred to by the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about an event 
It's a marker. It's a sign. And he says, when you see that, bug out. And he, in, in, the, in, the, in Luke's account, in Luke 21, he adds one other element in this context. He says, and when you see the armies surrounding Jerusalem, flee. So Jesus, as he's talking about it to his first century audience, his immediate followers, it's obviously something ahead, future, from their frame of reference. However, I want to focus in on this. It's very interesting, um, and I'll, we'll get to the so what in just a second, like why does it apply or why does it matter? It's, it's from the book of Daniel, as Jesus refer, references in Matthew, and here's what he says in Daniel. Daniel, the, There's a ton in the Old Testament prophet Daniel that's still to come, still from our frame of reference in history, still in our future, and it's fascinating. Anybody studied Daniel? There's a after Daniel gets some of these future visions that he writes down, he basically has, about a, break, has a breakdown. I mean, it kind of really messes with him to a certain extent. It's interesting to read the reality of how he processed what he was given to communicate to us. But this is one of the things. He says, and the, at the temple, he, and this he is an antagonist, an evil ruler, an oppressor of God's people uh, that was coming in the future. Um, He will set up an abomination that causes desolation. Now, what's an abomination? An abomination is something that is so intentionally offensive to God, or it could be to someone else, but in this case to God, intentionally offensive. I mean, blatantly rebellious and hateful against God. And I think we all hopefully have a sensitivity enough in our hearts to go, you know, I don't even want to, I don't even want to accidentally offend God or you know, disobey God unintentionally. Well, an abomination, biblically understood, is when someone says, no, 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 I'm trying with everything I got to be as rejecting of God as I can possibly be. To, to be as, as much as those who follow God would say he's worthy of praise and worship, I'm going to bring as, as intentionally as I can the opposites of praise and worship. I'm going to, that's what an abomination is. Something that's as, as cutting of an insult to God as I can possibly come up with or think of, <clears throat> an abomination. So he says this, that's what this future evil leader is going to do, and he says it's going to cause desolation. What does desolation mean? Yeah, we don't use that word a lot, do we, right? Desolation of smog. All right, let's go with me. All right, a little Lord of the Rings. What did smog do? He wiped out the whole place, right? So a desolation is turning something. Right, anyway, come on, help me out a little bit. A little, anybody the Lord of the Rings? So anyway, so a desolation is taking a place that should be, it should be flourishing and basically wiping it out, making it barren making it unfruitful, a place that should be teeming with life and making it and filling it with grief and death instead, which in this case is the temple. It's the temple mount. It's, the, it's Jerusalem, and this is the place when things are going the way God intends them and the way they should be and the way they will be when Jesus, after Jesus comes for all of eternity, when this place is the capital of joy. This is the central hub of celebration for mankind. This is the place that, in fact, when we go after Mark, we're going to do a selected uh, study of the book of Psalms. There's a whole category of Psalms in, in Israel's hymn book, basically, that are called Psalms of Ascent. And what this is, is these are the songs people collectively would sing together as they approached Jerusalem. Because it was the place of joy, the place of celebration. So they're singing this, yay, you know, we're getting to go to Jerusalem. We're going to march to Zion. Here we go. The place that should be that becomes a place of nothing but darkness and grief and sadness and death. That's desolation. So there's going to be this thing that in Jerusalem and the temple is going to cause it to turn from what should be the hub of celebration to the to the darkness of death. What should be the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, celebrated by all of His people, now God vacates and it's defined by His absence. And so this is what's in the book of Daniel. It's actually in a few places. There's in Daniel 11:31. it says his, this, this evil leader, he will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation predicted ahead, right? And this is what Jesus is talking about. 
what's wild, and I want you to understand this, that so many prof- prophecies in the Bible, Old Testament prophecies, especially looking forward, they have the nature to them that they, are, they have a dual fulfillment nature. There's often more than just one fulfillment. There's often a, a near and a far, kind of a close and a, and a, and a further away timeline-wise. Many of those about Jesus are that way. Many have kind of a nature to them that they, they're referencing something about His first coming, coming and something about His second coming all in one prophecy. So I think there's something to this prophecy that has that same nature to it. Because historically, here's what's happened. We know in 167 B.C., there was a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes the Fourth. All right, you guys, come on. I know not everybody's a history nerd like me, but try to put on a history geek kind of hat and just enjoy the, the moment for a little bit. If you guys remember Alexander the Great from history class, anybody, right? So, yeah, ruled whatever, most of the world, Greek. But after he died, they took his big empire and divided it into three. Um, and this one was the Seleucid Empire. And at one point, the Seleucid Empire, one of those, was taken over by this guy. That's where he fits in. Antiochus Epiphanes IV, and it was over basically what's part of now included part of Israel, Jerusalem, and he hated the Jews. He was working intentionally to oppress and suppress them, to eradicate their worship of God. And at one point then, you can read in the history books, he went down out of Jerusalem and he went down to attack one of the other kingdoms that came out of that, the the Ptolemaic Empire, kingdom, whatever, Egypt. He goes down there to fight them and defeats somebody in Egypt back at that point. And on his return, he does this thing in the temple because the Jews at that point began to rise up against him, form an army against him. You can read all about the Maccabeans, the Maccabean revolt. But what he did is he goes into the temple and he puts up a statue of Zeus in the place that was the Holy of Holies. And he takes what the Mosaic law had declared as unclean, takes a pig and sacrifices it on the altar. I'm talking about blatant, vile, intentional desecration of God's temple. And he does other things. They're pretty horrific. So this is what he does. So from Daniel's standpoint, that certainly would be would qualify that. Here's that guy, by the way, Antiochus Epiphanes. The inscription, you know what his name means? The, here's what it says. The inscription on this coin says, King Antiochus, God manifest bearer of victory. Hmm. And he set up a statue of Zeus there. But Jesus, in our passage, Mark 13, 14, says that it's a future event compared to their time in history, right? So what is that? And again, I started this whole series saying, man, I am not the eschatology expert of the world by any stretch. I've read books by people that some of those who are, and Daniel is very complex. And a lot of the different prophecies have a lot, uh, people have dug into them so intensely, and there, and there certainly could be. So I say this about specifically about the abomination that causes desolation Daniel refers to, that I believe at least in one part was fulfilled before Jesus, but Jesus is saying there's something still in the future from his seat in history that he calls that. What is that? I don't know. But the, the students of eschatology say, many of them say, it's a future event still to come and that the evil leader spoken of is the Antichrist and that these, this is an event that we can expect in, in and around the end times. Here's, here's one thing I want to submit. I'll give you my take on this. You've got to form your own interpretations and convictions. I believe, and again, back to our context and the the audiences Jesus is speaking to, I believe he's talking about an event that happened in 70 A.D. from Jesus' vantage point. Now, that doesn't mean that it couldn't also be something in the future additionally, that a temple will be built again and that the Antichrist will do something like this. It could. It could. But I don't know that it necessarily has to be. And so in 70 A.D., Titus, who later became the emperor of Rome in this great battle, the, the, the war there uh, with the Jews, he did what I think could be described as the, um, <laughs> the abomination of desolation yet again. Even though we don't have a record that he himself went in there and did something, uh, the, the way the battle went, and we have amazing uh, records of this from Josephus, first century historian, who was a Jewish general fighting this war against the Romans. 
and then was allowed to live and then became a Roman historian. He tells us that this great last siege, as it says in Luke, that when you see the armies surrounding Jerusalem, I think this was fulfilled is my point here of what Jesus is talking about. As he tells those in Judea, flee to the mountains. This is very specific to them. Get out of there. He tells us that, I guess, the, the, the population, of it happened at a time when there was one of the, one of the uh, feasts, one of the festivals coming. He says that 1.1 million Jews were killed. And the way the siege happened and then the way the, the final destruction of Jerusalem happened, including culminating with the destruction of the temple, the last holdout was the fortress of the temple. This is the last place where any of the resistance uh, finally fell and the whole place burned to the ground, intentionally stone from, uh, one stone removed from every other stone, as Jesus said would happen. But the last place where the slaughter took place was in the temple. And so the desecration there was not necessarily the same Titus doing what Antiochus Epiphanes had done, but, but nonetheless, the unclean, the death that littered the temple itself, I believe, is what Jesus is referring to here. So, so what's the so what? Uh, you know, I, I, as you talk about prophecies coming for second end times, some people say, and I've heard, been heard it taught, I've been taught this, that that whole, um, this event that's going to happen in the temple means if it's Antichrist doing it, it means that Jesus can't and won't come back again until the temple's rebuilt in Jerusalem. And that's the main argument, prophetically, that people hold on to that say, no, the temple has to be built first. If the event Jesus is referring to already happened, I don't think the temple necessarily has to be rebuilt. So that's the so what. So if you've been taught that theology, at least look into it a little more deeply, right? To go, because what's the whole, even what's the whole spirit of what Mark 13 is telling us. Jesus is saying, be ready. You don't know when the time comes. And I think we ought to watch out for interpretations that maybe say to us, well, I know that it's not now, or I know it's not soon, because I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure the temple has to be rebuilt. It might, it could. But I know Jesus said, be ready. Your, your response, your posture, your, your way of operating needs to be, it could be today. It could be right now, which brings us to the other event, which I think is going to have a little bit of a similar uh, application for us, and that's in, uh, look in verses 26 and 27. Clearly, verse 26 is the second coming. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, but He attaches to it this thing that I think, and here I'm going to make my case. You come up with your own conviction and conclusion, but I, I hope what I share with you has benefit to you. Verse 27, he says, and then he, Jesus, then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. Interesting, right? At his second coming, he says he's going to send out the angels and they're going to gather everybody. Gather the elect in this case. We're going to get them all to Jerusalem at that point where he comes. Which brings, I believe, this is talking about what we refer to as the rapture. And so let's go to, here's where I want to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Do you have that there? Turn over there. So those of you brand new to church, brand new to this whole stuff, what's the rapture? Never heard of that before, right? Let me give you the, the, the idea. The rapture, the word literally just means to be caught up. That's what the word means, or caught away. The idea is that God's going to take His people. He's going to catch them up to heaven or meet Him, uh, to be with Him at some point. Now the debate becomes when, right? And the, a, a common interpretation that's been turned into movies and books and all these things too is that that will happen for, the, for believers in Jesus significantly before a lot of bad stuff happens at the end, right? And so you have this thing, and it has its rooting in Daniel back to these whole things, which we're not going to go into. And if you ask me about it, I'm not promising to go into on the podcast. But kind of all these, Daniel talks about this, these, he's got some specific time words and time frames he uses and schedules he presents. But they're, again, they're mysterious to us and not, not easy to get concrete on. But he talks about these uh, periods of year sevens, these, these weeks of years, these 77s, you know, seasons, and, and there's ways you can map stuff out, and it really is. There, there's a lot of it that makes sense as to why it goes all the way up to when describing the exact time Jesus died. But then there's this mysterious kind of, in essence, last week of seven years that hasn't happened yet. It's almost been put on hold until the end. And so we, a lot of people say, well, and, and there could be a lot to this, and I'm, I'm, I think there is. 
But there's this last kind of final hurrah era right before Jesus comes that's in essence a seven-year period. You've heard it talked about that. Sometimes it's called the Great Tribulation. And the general consensus or thought, often taught, and I'm not saying this isn't right, but is that this is the time over which the Antichrist will step up and there will be this world rule, right? And maybe for the first three and a half years of it, in fact, in Daniel, he actually names 1,290 days in a couple of these prophecies, three and a half years. For the first half of it, it seems like everything's kind of going okay, and then the last three is when it really gets bad, and you get into Revelation, and then it talks about this Antichrist. He, he's given a little bit of a period of time where he's allowed to make war on the church, on the saints, and he's given some ability to overcome them, to, to kill many. But then there's this question, what's the rapture where Jesus is catching up, catching away, you know, where God's catching away His people? And so the belief is, there's a few of these, one is well, He's going to catch away His people at the beginning of that seven-year period. And there's an, that's called, this cool, you're going to get to be really cool here today. So that's called pre-trib. That's like the cool way to say it. It could pre-tribulation, rapture. Anyway. So pre-trib if you're cool. And then there's one that's like, well, maybe halfway through that seven-year period, right before things get really bad, if you believe that, that's when the rapture happens. You get, Christians get called it. That's called mid-trib. All right. And then there's the, the final one where it's like, well, no, it actually happens kind of simultaneous with Jesus' second coming. The convenient thing of pre-trib or mid-trib is, if that's true, and it could be, I hope, I hope it is, um, then Christians, right before all the stuff really goes bad and Antichrist does all of his stuff, Christians are going to get bailed out of that. Uh, now, there will be Christians who become Christians after the rapture, and they'll still have to deal with stuff, but me and you, if we're Christians right now today, and that day happens tomorrow, whew, yes, we're good, we're golden. However, I don't think that's the way it's going to play out. Because, and I was taught that, and I was, I've read books explaining that, I mean, in great detail, elaborate detail, and, and if it's right, I hope it's right, I hope I'm wrong. However, um, every time I would read a book on that, explaining it, it always felt to me like it was a little bit, the, the reasoning was a little shaky, and the connections and assumptions that got built in to make it, say, pre-trib or even mid-trib felt a little stretched to me. You go study and decide on your own is what I'm saying to you. So what I decided to do after college, reading books, uh, graduate school, seminary, really in studying this, I said, you know what, Look, I, I want to just read what the Bible says in relationship to this as if I'd never been taught a preconceived thing before. And what would I read if I'm just a plain Joe guy coming to the Bible wanting to know what's, what's going on here? And so that's, that's, I encourage you to do the same thing. I encourage you to do that with every doctrine, everything line up what maybe your preconceived ideas are with what it actually says. And so here we are in 1 Thessalonians 4. This is the only place in the Bible that the word rapture is used. So let's look, read it in its context. Here's what it says. But we do not, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 4. I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that means physically dead, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. All right, so let's just stop there for a second. At least Paul includes himself in this first, first person. He knows there are going to be some believers alive when Jesus comes. Not everybody's vacated the scene, right? Some believers will be living when Jesus comes. And Peter includes himself, I mean, Paul includes himself here. Now, I understand you could say, well, no, 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 he's just projecting because he knows what he's writing is Holy Scripture, and this, he's including himself in a loose way, you know, associating with people who will be alive, but he's certainly expecting to be raptured out first. I, okay, if, they, if that's your argument, I understand that. But my counter-argument would be it's at least as plausible, if not more plausible, that Paul's belief about himself was that he certainly could live until he himself saw Jesus' the second coming. All right. So, go on. So, and if so, then let's read this. Says, the coming of the Lord, uh, we will not precede those that have fallen asleep. Verse 16, for here's how it's going to go down. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout 
with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's a whole other thing. Somebody already asked it in the first service, so I'll get to it on the podcast. What do you mean? What's that light? I, th- I thought we were already with the Lord. What's this, you know, dead in Christ rise to meet Him? We'll talk about resurrected bodies and all those things. It, I'll try to hit that in the podcast. It's, it's mysterious and wonderful all at the same time. But here we go. Here's our focus, verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain until Christ comes, what he's talking about, will be caught up. That's the word rapture. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. So, look, when I've re- I tell you, when I've read these things and you read them yourself too, to say that the catching up, the rapture is somehow separated from actual coming of Jesus by seven years or three and a half years, isn't this most straightforward reading of this text, is it? This sure sounds like this catching up, and again, this is the only place that the Scriptures say that specifically. This sure sounds like it's simultaneous or right there at the same time as the second coming, doesn't it? Yeah, it does to me. Um, and this is the way the nature of Scripture is. It's, it's, a, it, it's pretty plain, straightforward. If the common sense makes sense, seek no other sense, Right? And so I, I, that's why I see it that way. And then, so let's go back to our, to our Mark 13. This is what Jesus, I believe, is saying in between verses 26 and 27, what he's describing about sending the angel out, angels out together to gather everybody from the ends of the earth, the elect specifically in this text. Now go back quickly to that Matthew 13. You guys, let's go focus here. We've got lunch coming, but we can hang in here for now. This is before the end of his ministry, earlier in his ministry when he's talking about sowing seeds and wants everybody to be the soil that bears a hundred times the amount that he sows in. They're asking questions. Really, the question is kind of about, well, why, are there still, why is there so much evil? Why are you allowing evil? When are you going to deal with evil and evil people? And he tells them this parable in verses 24 to 30 about the He describes God's people, those following God, as, as wheat Those following not God's ways who are uh, agents of evil in the world, he calls them tares, that means weeds, growing up trying to choke out God's purposes and God's Word and God's work and God's people. And he tells them all about that. And then, I won't read all that, you can read it on your own, but let's go. Then he gives the explanation of that parable beginning in verse 36. So follow this if you would and listen to the connection to what we've just seen Jesus say in Mark 13 in relationship to 1 Thessalonians 4 and the rapture. He says, and he left the crowds and went to the house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares or the weeds are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. So you get the imagery, right? This great gathering of all people, separating them out, some for life and some for judgment, he's saying that gathering, that quote-unquote harvest, the collection of the people, is at the end of the age. And the ones who do the gathering are the angels. They go get them. Just what Jesus said, I believe, in Mark 13, 27. That's what he's describing. And he's going to send the angels at his second coming to go get everybody. So verse 40, so just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels. They will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And, so, and if you go, you want to read about that gathering. Matthew records it in Matthew 25, I believe. And this is what Jesus is talking about in Mark 13, 27. And he specifically refers to the elect, the chosen ones, the believers. Gather all the believers from all over the world. That's the gathering. And he says there to, to meet, meet, him, meet him at his second coming, meet him in the air. Here's Jesus coming, un, unable to miss Jesus coming in great power and great glory in the clouds. As Paul says in Thessalonians, we will be caught up to meet him in the clouds, he says specifically. Joining the great hosts of heaven, every believer in God who's died 
in Christ is with Him and comes with Him in this incredible, this incredible invasion from heaven to earth. And those who are alive at that point, this is the rapture, I believe, are caught up to meet Him in the air and come with Him to make this earth, as the great old uh, hymn says, to make the kingdom of this earth the kingdom of our God. And there's this simultaneous gathering of all people, all souls. We read it in Matthew 25 where He brings everybody for judgment. And there is the separation. He refers to them as sheep and goats in that. I think tares and wheat. And there's this judgment, this inauguration of the kingdom of God on earth. All right, so what? So what? I know what I was taught and in the flavor in our church around this teaching that the rapture was pre-trib, you know, we're going we're gonna to be taken. I know that the flavor, the spirit, the attitude that encouraged in us as believers was, whew, things are going to get really hard at the end, but whew, we're not going to be there. That's the so what. Let's not fall for that trap and not be prepared for whatever might lie ahead. This is how Jesus finishes Mark 13. You be watchful. You be prepared. You stay doing what I've called you to do. You stay faithful to keep doing what I've called you to do to the very end. In fact, he includes that in in Mark 13. Even to the first century followers of him, he said, here's what's coming for you guys. You're going to be handed over in the synagogues. You're going to be hated by all people because of me. And he said, but whoever, what did he say in the end of verse 13? But whoever endures to the end will be saved. Where is there ever this message in Scripture to believers of Jesus that, hey, I'll, I'll completely bail you out of having to endure anything? No, the message is you make sure you're ready to endure anything and you stay faithful to the end. You keep putting one foot in front of the other until you see me. And oh, by the way, I'm going to help you do that. You rely on me. I'll ne- what is the last words he said to his followers before he ascended? At the end of Matthew, he gives us the commission. He gives us our marching orders and he finishes it by saying, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age. He's given us His strength, and in His strength we are able to endure whatever we have to endure. This is the call. This is the commission. Let's watch out a little bit. If some sure feels good interpretation, and man, I hope I'm wrong on this and we're out of there. That's great. I vote for comfort too over persecution. (laughs) But let's listen to what God is saying here those who endure to the end. And notice how he says it. What's the purpose of this? As he says in verse 9 here of Mark 13, you guys who are about to be delivered into the courts and you're going to be flogged and you're going to, be, you're going to stand before governors and kings. Why? As a testimony for me. Our hope and goal and wish isn't to escape harm. Our hope and goal and wish is to be faithful, to testify to God. And sometimes the most powerful testimony is enduring In fact, you get into Revelation, brothers and sisters. This is the purpose of it. Revelation talking all about the hardship at the end and how it's going to play out. John, when he begins the whole thing, says, look, I'm writing this to you. I'm a fellow sufferer with yours. And and here's what defines us is our patient endurance. And among all the things that are very prophetic and mysterious in Revelation, among those that are clear to do, there's no way to, to miss this. He says twice later in Revelation, he says, if anyone's supposed to go into captivity, then that's what's going to happen to them. If anyone's supposed to be killed with a sword, that's what's going to happen to them. But here's the point. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on, on the part of God's people. This is the calling. He says it again in the next chapter. He says, this calls for patient endurance on the part of God's people who keep the commands and remain faithful to Jesus. That's our focus, brothers and sisters. This is our mission. He's saying to us, you keep putting one foot in front of the other. You keep trusting me and doing what I've called you to do. No matter what happens, if they shut you down, they burn your building down, they take away all your money, they throw you in jail. They starve you to death. They send you to the lions. It's a chance for a testimony. You keep following, trusting, obeying, and witnessing for me. This is the message of preparation for whatever it's going to look like for you and me going forward. And I see this in our text. So we talked about, we've got Dr. George and his family here. And part of 
the privilege we have in partnering with them includes direct partners with us who are in, um, are in the fire right now. Uh, we got an uh, urgent text message earlier in the week that came with this video I'm about to show you from, from one of our partners right there said, well, within the last couple of nights, they burned in the general area, burned down 20 churches, hundreds of homes, killed hundreds. The in-laws of our partner on the ground there had to flee for their lives. Fortunately, in their case, good news is they uh, made it into a camp, an army camp, and they're waiting to be assigned to a refugee camp. Um, and then other that we've heard of, one of the other partners through the partnership um, ha- came back from a, a time of serving uh, significantly where he was. I've got to be careful what I say and how I say it. Um, should be a cause of great celebration. Talk about the you know, uh, Psalms of ascent to desolation. Came back to see his house burned to the ground. Went to having nothing but the clothes on his back. Obviously discouraged, battling discouragement. Struggle. Okay, now what, right? The call is to patiently endure. This is what we can expect as a testimony. And as we have opportunities to live our lives, continuing to put one foot in front of the other, faithfully doing what God's given us to do, trusting what God's told us is true, the more that endurance muscle gets stronger, and the more the, the, the way that our sufferings fit into the proper perspective gets clearer. Let me, let me show you the video here that the guy sent us this week. Of what, what, that, that's a church building being built right now. Okay, that's, that's so, Here's what we know. We know Jesus is coming back. We know we're going to be with him forever. We know he's told us to patiently endure whatever comes. He's told us not to fear. He's told us to keep putting one foot in front of the other. So there's some great ways to practice and build those muscles and honor God. Hopefully none of that ever affects any of us, right? Hopefully don't ever burn this place down. Hopefully we all get to travel in our retirement or something, right? Hopefully we all have more than one pair of clothes. Okay, that's great. But it, in the end, it doesn't matter, does it? What matters is to be faithful with His strength and help, put one foot in front of the other until we see Him, either by going to Him first or Him coming to get us. That's it. And he's given us the strength to do that, and he's made it a joy ultimately to do that. And he's made it a powerful way to fulfill the mission he's given us to do that. And he's given us opportunities to practice those muscles. Are you in a hard relationship right now? Is your marriage hard right now? This is a great chance to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Keep patiently endure and keep pressing on. Endure, continuing to love and trust God to do, even if it appears hopeless, even if it doesn't feel good, even if it's, it's a struggle and you're in some form of pain as a result of it. Patiently endure. Keep going. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Trust God. Rely on His strength. Ask Him for His help. Obey Him no matter what. Maybe it's not your marriage. Maybe it's parenting. Maybe it's some other relationship. Maybe it's the calling God's put on your life. Maybe it's trying to be a witness where all you're getting is abuse and response. Keep putting one foot in front of the other, brothers and sisters, because we're going to be with him soon. And Stephen shared this at our men's breakfast yesterday where he taught our men. It was phenomenal. And this is the reality you'll discover, brothers and sisters, that our present sufferings, whatever they might look like, Lion's den, house burned down, whatever. It's honestly kind of irrelevant ultimately. They're not worth comparing. They're that small. They're not worth comparing with the glory that awaits and will be there soon. I'm going to pray over us. I want to bless you, and then we'll be dismissed. And if you want to stay for lunch, it'll be in the basement. 
God, I ask you to help us, to help us learn and obey and focus and follow in the ways you've called us to. And God, when we talk about end times, and especially with a lot of the grave uh, kind of descriptions that you've given us, Lord, it can be scary initially, but I know it's accompanied by your promise. You're with us. You'll protect us. You'll see us through. You'll give us the strength to, to handle anything. And you've, you've promised you're coming back, and you've promised that whatever suffering might come, it will be short-lived and minuscule in comparison. And you've promised to be with us, and you've promised to give us the strength for every need and every, um, every obstacle that we face. And so we teach us, God, to, to lean into you and, and to trust you and to rely on your strength, not our own. And, oh, God, stir in us an extraordinary level of endurance that we would be those people who really find the glory in just putting one foot in front of the other and not stopping for your glory and for our good. And Jesus, yeah, we'd love for you to come back right now. (laughs) But we know you're going to come back at the right time in the right way. Just make us faithful till then. And I thank you that you're doing that. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His 